Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams, and today I'd like to present part two of my series on the selected gross pathology of the liver. As I do at the beginning of all of my lectures, I want to thank those friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me images either directly or through online collections, which allow me to put these lectures together. Today we're going to talk about viral diseases which hit the liver. This is not going to be an encyclopedic lecture because there are tremendous numbers of viruses, some I probably don't even know about, that hit the liver. But let's look at some of the very important viruses, how they affect the liver, and some of the different species which might be affected. I think that herpes viruses, especially the alpha herpes viruses, should be at the top of everyone's lists for their effects on the liver. Almost every species has a herpes virus, and many of them will result in systemic necrosis, almost always including the liver. Here we're looking at the viscera of a foal, a classic species, which can be affected by equine herpes virus type 1. And in the foal, you will see uh, abortions, stillborns, very weak foals, and there will be multifocal areas of necrosis, which represented by these little white dots within this markedly enlarged liver, this markedly enlarged spleen. The animals often will have uh, edema or interstitial pneumonia, and if you look closely under the microscope, you will see large areas of necrosis in this organ as well. Let's look just a little closer for a very characteristic representation of herpes viral necrosis in the liver, and you can see these little white dots. In certain species, such as horses and dogs, you most always, almost always, will see a systemic herpes viral disease and liver necrosis in very young animals. But don't forget, you can occasionally see it in adult animals as well. In the dog, we most often associate canine herpes virus type 1 with puppies, especially in the first 10 days of life when they cannot regulate their temperature. And there is systemic necrosis, although most of the pictures that you will see will be uh, areas of necrosis and hemorrhage within the kidney. But this is going on in the liver as well. Another herpes virus that becomes systemic in young animals is the herpes virus that's known as suet herpes virus type 1, causes a disease known as Augeski's disease or pseudorabies, and in animals less than two weeks of age will cause multifocal necrosis in the liver, the spleen, and then you will see severe congestion and hemorrhage in the brain as well. It's very uncommon to see it in animals older than this. It is a herpes virus that can infect a number of animal species, including rodents, and often will cause a severe pruritus at the site of a bite by an infected animal, from what it gets the name mad itch. but it's most often associated with disease in young piglets. Here's a great picture of that canine herpes virus type 1 from Aaron Edwards at uh, Texas A&M University. And you can see these areas of white coalescing areas of necrosis. And if you look at that under the microscope, you're going to see the classic intranuclear inclusions of herpes virus. Historically, uh, we do see it in puppies, but over the years I've seen it in a number of adult animals, uh, usually adult military working dogs under stress. I may see uh, one every couple of years. So don't say it's just a puppy disease. So these are all alpha herpes viruses. Remember that alpha herpes viruses, their classic lesions are those of necrosis. Let's go through a couple of other uh, alpha herpes viruses that we should know about. And the one that anyone with any laboratory animal exposure should know about is the Maccasine herpes virus type 1. It's been known as herpes virus B. And it is an alpha herpes virus that will infect old world 
monkeys, especially macaques, and can be transmitted to people. And when that particular virus jumps species and goes into people, there's about 70% fatality rate. Luckily, we haven't seen many uh, infections within the last 20 years, but about 70% fatality rate due to a fatal encephalitis. And this is one of the big problems with alpha herpes viruses that figure out how to jump species. Rhesus monkeys will carry this uh, herpes virus generally in a latent form. It goes into the nerves. When they're stressed, they may exhibit ulcers on the lips and the genitalia, much like we see with herpes virus simplex 1 and 2 in humans. It doesn't usually cause much problems for the monkeys unless they are concomitantly severely immunosuppressed, uh, i.e. they may be infected with simian lentivirus, um, and then they can develop a fulminant systemic necrotizing illness, and here it is causing those large patches of necrosis within the liver in this animal who obviously did not survive its bout with herpes virus B. This is a major reason that we should always wear personal protective gear when posting macaques and go into each autopsy believing that that animal is infected. If you're prepared, the chances of coming in contact with this is much lessened. Diseases of non-human primates are often those of captivity. And New World primates, especially such as marmosets or aotis monkeys, are very susceptible to uh, a trans species jump of herpes simplex 1 from humans, someone that has a cold sore, to, uh, uh, to a New World monkey, where it will cause, once again, a systemic necrotizing illness with necrosis in many different organs here, or patches of necrosis in the liver and the spleen. And this animal might have the unfortunate history of sharing a sandwich with a handler or something like that, which was not uncommon back in the day. But somewhere along the line, someone with an open cold sore or in a prodromal serious um, uh, has spread this human virus to the uh, New World primates in a center. And usually they will die quickly with minimal premonitory signs um, And then one other uh, herpes viral illness that affects New World primates, especially macaques, is simian varicella virus. Here in a great picture from Dr. Renee Honkannon in a pigtail macaque where we can see these small areas of necrosis within the liver and the spleen. Uh, Simian varicella virus is highly contagious for macaques, African green monkeys, and patus monkeys will usually give you a pretty profound cutaneous rash uh, at the same time that you have necrosis in multiple organs. This particular uh, herpes virus is related to human varicella, which is a causative agent of chickenpox. Birds have a number of herpes viruses that cause disease. One that causes high mortality in cytosine birds is an alpha herpes virus, which causes the disease of Pacheco's disease. There are large confluent areas of necrosis in this section of liver. Histologically, you would see the inclusions in many hepatocytes, and often you will see syncytial cells. Another very characteristic a histologic finding in alpha herpes virus infection. Not all citizens are affected similarly with Pacheco's disease. Cockatoos and Amazons seem to be very susceptible and will die suddenly, but other citizens like Conyers uh, often have latent infections and are implicated as carriers. This particular herpes virus um, is closely related to the one that causes mucosal papillomas of the cloaca and the upper digestive system of parrots, but it's not the exact same virus. And we covered that in the uh, one of the last lectures in the uh, diseases of the gastrointestinal tract. And while the characteristic lesion of Pacheco's disease is widespread hepatic necrosis, you can also see foci of necrosis in the spleen, hemorrhage on serous membranes, 
And uh, you can see necrosis in multiple other organs, including the pancreas, the intestine, and the crop. We can wind up our a uh, brief and somewhat monotonous and repetitive review of alpha herpes viral infection in the liver with one more lesion in birds. This is a great horned owl, only the classic little white dit dots of necrosis in the liver. This is a herpes virus called the columbid herpes virus and is a herpes virus that affects wild birds of play, owls and other, ra other raptors. Um, which eat pigeons. It is normally found in pigeons. It doesn't seem to cause any problems in the pigeon. But uh, when in, ingested by a bird of prey, will cause a systemic necrotizing illness. And, and you can probably name four or five different organs by now that are concomitantly affected. Now, something that is very important to remember is, you know, even in something like uh, owls, they have a number of different herpes viruses. It's one that they get here from their prey and a number of uh, herpes viruses that are natural to them, like strigid herpes virus type 1 and falconid herpes virus type 1. And I've always said that almost every species, if you look long enough or you wait till something comes in with necrosis in the liver, you're going to identify a herpes virus. Herpes viruses are extremely common. Uh, macaques may have 15, 20, I think they're over 20 by now, so they're not uncommon. They often tend to cause the same type of disease. So whenever I see uh, little white dots in the liver in just about any species, herpes viral disease is always going to be somewhere on my differential list. So don't sleep on the alpha herpes viruses. Okay, we've talked enough about the alpha herpes viruses. Let's move into another type of DNA virus that will cause damage in the liver. This is a picture of multifocal areas of hemorrhage, which represent areas of necrosis within the liver of a young dog. And this is due to infection with canine adenovirus type 1. Because of, because of widespread vaccination, we don't see a lot of canine adenovirus type 1 disease anymore. And most of the disease is seen in animals that are in early stages of vaccination or are unvaccinated. Remember, there are two types of adenoviruses in dogs, canine adenovirus type 1, which affects the liver, canine adenovirus type 2, which primarily affects the lungs. And if you have trouble remembering that, just remember you have one liver and two lungs, and that'll help you keep it straight. Canine adenovirus type 2 has long been used as a vaccine for canine adenovirus type 1 before the current crop of subunit vaccines became popular. Canine adenovirus type 1 causes a disease known as infectious canine hepatitis in dogs and bears. In dogs, there's a pretty widespread disease from acute fulminant infection to sort of a, a subclinical infection. And the, uh, the disease is most often seen in young animals less than 30 days of age. Um, it often overlaps with uh, canine herpes virus, which generally has about a 10 to 14 day cutoff. Um, but uh, canine adenovirus will, will go out for approximately 30 days. The lesions that we see in canine adenovirus are very consistent with the <clears throat> cellular tropism of the virus. Canine adenovirus goes after endothelial cells uh, and hepatocytes. It also has a bit of tropism for uh, renal tubular epithelial cells and uh, lymphocytes. So the primary lesions that you will see are necrosis and hemorrhage within the liver and necrosis and hemorrhage in the kidney. Because it does like endothelial cells, you could see necrosis and hemorrhage in any organ of the body, but uh, in an animal with fulminant disease, the lesions will be very pronounced in the, uh, in the liver and the kidney. And also you will see necrosis of lymphoid follicles, the white pulp of the spleen, um, as sort of a, a secondary lesion associated with adenovirus. In the old days, when all these diseases had, uh, had interesting names, this was also known as fox encephalitis and rhubarth disease. And in a very small percentage of uh, dogs infected with canine adenovirus, you will see hemorrhage and necrosis in the brainstem, a very unusual 
lesion in the dog and one that points directly at a canine adenovirus if you ever see that lesion. Hemorrhage in the brainstem is very unusual. I think about it with listeria uh, in small rumens especially. You can see listeria in the brainstem in large rumens but they don't get hemorrhage and the only thing I've ever seen cause hemorrhage in the uh, brainstem of a dog is canine adenovirus. Here's a great picture from Ron Porter of multifocal to coalescing necrosis in the liver of a chicken. And chickens get a number of adenoviruses, and the one that probably is the most famous is the one that causes inclusion body hepatitis. That is so uh, typical of adenoviruses. It causes these big, beautiful uh, inclusions in the areas of necrosis that they cause. You, you just can't miss them. They jump right off of the uh, microscope slide at you. So here we have a very large mottled liver with areas of necrosis in a chicken. And this is due to avian adenovirus type 1. Remember there are three different uh, groups of adenoviruses in poultry. Uh, inclusion body hepatitis belongs to type 1. Type 2 are the ones that are sort of related to uh, hemorrhagic enteritis in turkeys, marble spleen disease in pheasants, and splenomegaly in chickens. And then uh, type 3 causes egg drop syndrome in chickens. With inclusion body hepatitis, you may see concurrent infection with a number of other agents, including chickenemia virus, infection bursal disease, or even avian leukosis. They often go hand in hand, and the liver is going to be enlarged and very swollen and pale. And another lesion that you often see in association with inclusion body hepatitis is hydropericardium. And it's a wonderful picture by Dr. Kim Newkirk, which shows you the hydropericardium associated with that. Um, you can find the beautiful inclusions in areas of necrosis, primarily in the liver, but sometimes you may see them in the pancreas as well in infected birds. So that's inclusion body hepatitis due to adenoviruses. There are a number of other adenoviruses that affect animal species, but uh, they have a very wide range. Some are respiratory in nature and like to hit the, uh, the respiratory epithelium, the airways, um, such as we might see in humans, in non-human primates or guinea pigs. Uh, in cattle, they tend to affect uh, endothelial cells, which is somewhat unusual. But uh, they do cause some very significant disease in certain animal species in the liver. Okay, moving on to another virus which has a wide range of tropism depending on what type of species you're look, looking at. And these are the coronaviruses. Coronaviruses fall into several different camps. There are a lot of coronaviruses that cause gastrointestinal disease within the GI tract. That would include something like TGE and uh, uh, the various enteric coronaviruses that affect cats and ferrets. Some are respiratory pathogens, such as uh, the uh, SARS virus, respiratory uh, coronaviruses that also affect uh, laboratory rodents. And some have a very uh, different and interesting uh, uh, pathogenesis that allow them to affect multiple organs. One classic that you'll see, and I don't generally consider it particularly a pathogen of the liver, is feline enteric coronavirus, which in uh, certain cats, in a very small minority of cats, maybe one in a thousand, will mutate within macrophages and result in uh, the ability to survive within macrophages and it will not be cleared by the body. This results in a disease known as feline infectious peritonitis. There's a similar disease in, uh, uh, in ferrets, uh, which is called coronavirus-associated granulomatous disease. And because the body can't clear the virus, eventually you get to the point that you have so much viral antigen circulating in the blood and so much antibody that is non-neutralizing and is produced by these cats that it begins to precipitate out in, uh, in blood vessels throughout the body. And the liver is a very common site. You will see uh, uh, inflammation. And this may be lymphoplasmacytic, it may be histiocytic, there may be some neutrophils. No two cases of FIP ever look alike under the microscope. 
but uh, you'll see that uh, centered on vessels throughout the liver, uh, especially on the liver capsule, and you may see a fibrinous capsulitis. I see some areas here that are a little bit roughened, and it makes me think that uh, there's some fiber. And then all of these areas are probably around vessels within the hepatic parenchyma. But it's not going to be limited to the liver. You're going to see it in every organ. You may see it in a certain range of organs. Uh, you may see it in the brain very commonly. You may see it in the spleen. Um, but the inflammation is generally centered on vessels. And in cats, whenever I see vasculocentric inflammation, I want to make sure that we run the uh, antigen for coronavirus. Coronavirus antigen, the GP70 antigens, uh, immunostains, work very well across multiple species. Um, it's from cats, but you can it'll work very well on ferrets and pigs and quite a number of species. So that is always on the top of my list for vasculocentric inflammation. That's what I'm looking here at the liver. So vasculocentric lymphoplasmacytic or lymphohistiocytic inflammation in a cat, FIP is always going to top my list. Another coronavirus which is also affects a wide range of organs is one that has been a real problem over the years. Now we got a handle on it in, uh, in mice and that is mouse coronavirus. Because of the classic lesions that the hepatotropic strains um, or the polytropic strains cause in the liver, it was given the name mouse hepatitis virus, but the polytropism um, of those strains is seen in a number of organs, including the intestine, um, and you can see, see it occasionally in other organs as well. There are two basic strains of, of mouse coronavirus, the uh, polytropic and the enterotropic. And the enterotropic, like the name says, only gives you lesions, particularly syncytia, within the, uh, within the enterocytes. Um, when nude mice were first developed, and this is a picture from a nude mice, it was the absolute scourge of nude mice colonies. And nowadays, if you ever see it, it's probably going to be an immunosuppressed mouse, and it's been a latent infection that's been maintained in immunosuppressed mice. But as you can see here, it causes really tremendous multifocal coalescing necrosis, just these large swaths of, of necrotic hepatocytes. One thing that it does is it causes syncytia. We talked about that. Um, you can see syncytia in the intestine. Um, you see these absolutely beautiful syncytia in the liver that you would think are megakaryocytes in any other species. But they're also often also necrotic as well, so it can be tough to pick out. But when I see large areas of necrosis and multinucleate syncytia within the uh, liver of a mouse, my mind is going to go straight to mouse coronavirus. There are other viruses that will cause... Uh, uh, hepatic necrosis, but usually not to the extent. You always have to consider the possibility of herpes virus, cytomegalovirus, adenovirus, and real virus type 3 are all viruses that may cause multifocal necrosis. But when I see this amount of necrosis, boy, I'm going to think about mouse hepatitis virus. Can we talk about some other fun viruses that cause uh, disease in domestic animal species? Nothing else looks like this. This is the classic dish rag liver, and the reason it's so floppy is because there is massive hepatic necrosis. Now, let's use our terminology properly. Massive hepatic necrosis refers to the distribution of necrosis within the hepatic lobule. So, massive hepatic necrosis results in necrosis in central lobular hepatocytes, midzonal hepatocytes, and periporeal hepatocytes, all areas of the hepatic lobule. doesn't mean that there's lots and lots of necrosis. The, uh, the picture I just showed you of mouse coronavirus, there's a lot, a lot of necrosis in there, but it's not massive. It's central lobular and midzonal, but this is absolutely massive. And when you kill off all those hepatocytes, all that's left is the, uh, the bile ducts and the, uh, the connective tissue. Everything else is gone. So the liver tends to lose its shape. It is floppy. This is a condition we refer to histologically as stromal collapse, and it will just sort of flow over the side of your hand as you hold it. There's a lot of great pictures out there of these dish rag livers. 
Um, this is a condition no, that goes by a lot of different names in animals. Uh, serum sickness, Tyler's disease, and it's the most common cause of acute hepatic failure in horses. These horses um, often show concurrent uh, evidence of hepatoencephalopathy because there's just no liver there to take ammonia out of circulation and the effect of ammonia on the brain is fairly devastating. These animals are blind, they're head pressing, they're severely neurologic. And this is a condition that uh, we've known about for over a hundred years. It was most commonly seen in animals that were used to produce uh, various numbers of medicants, especially uh, antibodies or antitoxins where they were injected with antigens. And, and then uh, um, it has been seen in animals that are injected with various types of xenobiotics like vaccines or, or certain types of drugs. It almost always pops up between 40 to 70, sometimes all the way out to 160 days after receiving these injections. Um, some of the ones that, uh, specific ones over the years were tetanus antitoxin or, or antiserum for equine encephalomyelitis or pregnant mare serum gonadotropin. So it's very wide ranging. And the really interesting thing about this is not all the animals have that history. Some had the unfortunate uh, uh, history of simply being stabled next to an animal that uh, had received this biologic. So it's always been thought that this might be due to an infectious agent. And within the last 10 years, there were uh, two different agents, one I think that has been discounted, but at least got people thinking about viral agents again, and that was a, a flavivirus, which was identified, I think, metagenomically uh, in an animal with this. Within the last five years, it has become apparent that this is probably due to an equine Borna virus. No, I'm sorry. I, you know, this changes so often. So it's actually a new type of parvovirus in the uh, genus Copi parvovirus. This is the most recent uh, uh, identification. There's been a number of papers on this, and there is a very nice paper that was just published this year in Emerging Infectious Diseases. Um, and this was a horse initially generated from an investigation, a horse in Nebraska, um, which died of this particular condition. And this new equine parvovirus uh, was identified both in the serum and the liver from the horse and from a infected antitoxin. And the investigational group uh, contaminated a tetanus antitoxin with the same virus injected in two more horses, which developed the disease. So I think we may have finally hit on the, uh, the correct etiology for this particular disease. So that's a Copi parvovirus, and I will try to remember it if you promise that you will try to remember it too. Um, in this particular condition, it is a, a low... Uh, morbidity, but a very high mortality, about 90% or more, um, will die as a result of development of this particular disease. So, Tyler's disease, equine serum, hepatitis, all these are names for this one particular condition. Oh, how did this one slip out? Uh, little white dead dots, liver, this is another herpes virus. So uh, I should put that back up with the other herpes viruses. This is a duck liver. This is an added herpes virus, which causes a, a GI disease in waterfowl known as duck plague. And uh, if you know one herpes virus, you know the rest. This has a couple of uh, sort of interesting other lesions like paraphimosis, but... Uh, let's not say too much more. Duck plague likes to hit uh, the lymphoid tissue, and then you will get necrosis within the liver and the uh, uh, widespread necrosis within the intestine, also, caused, uh, also called duck enteritis virus. You usually have big, uh, big epizootics of this particular, where it just wipes out every a susceptible animal, leaving a couple that are resistant, and that's uh, and then the uh, the outbreak will burn itself out. Okay.
Moving on to another type of virus which will cause liver disease, this is Khaleesi virus. And you're thinking, well, that's not the liver. This is an animal that uh, is bleeding out. But remember that the liver is the site of the production of all your coagulation factors. So one of the very common um, results of liver failure is uh, long in the long term or in the midterm is the uh, is disseminated intravascular coagulation because you simply do not have the uh, ability to make coagulation factors. And we'll also talk a little bit about this when we get into the various toxicities, including vitamin K toxicity. But getting back to uh, rabbit Khaleesi virus, it causes a, a epizootic disease, which was first seen in China in 1984, but is now diagnosed all over the world. First outbreak in the U.S. was in the early 2000s. And it's a special uh, special genus of the Khaleesi viruses called the lagoviruses, a good name for something that affects rabbits. There is a related virus called the European brown hare syndrome, or at least the disease is named. And there was a somewhat related but less uh, severe virus identified in Michigan a number of uh, years ago, which only shows about 79% homology. The lesions are similar, but you don't have these massive die-offs. And these animals are going to die of DIC because this Khaleesi virus causes massive hepatic necrosis. The liver is totally wiped out. Um, it often seems to me that the animals die a lot faster than you would see with uh, with uh, a lack of coagulation factors because the virus n doesn't just hit the liver. It also hits endothelial cells and lymphocytes, um, and you get a really nice uh, enter necrotizing enteritis at, at all. So it's going after multiple cell types, including uh, including all the lymphoid cells. It's whacking the hepatocytes and the enterocytes, and you'll see hemorrhages throughout the body, especially in the lungs. The morbidity is 80% in naive populations. Mortality is over 90%. Usually what you see is a big pile of dead bunnies. It's spread by direct contact. Um, you can have some long-term carriers. These are the ones that don't die, and they're going to carry this, uh, they're going to carry this virus, and they're going to shed it through the urine. Um, this is a virus that, and a number of viruses, I usually use the term necrosis, but a number of them um, result in apoptosis of hepatocytes. And that can be sort of a, a tenuous difference and something that you probably have to uh, be very familiar with the pathogenesis of, this, of these viruses. But this is one that causes apoptosis. Um, and we'll look at a couple more that do that. The apoptosis starts in the central areas and spreads out, eventually getting to the periportal hepatocytes. And it doesn't cause just apoptosis of of hepatocytes. You also see uh, apoptosis in uh, endothelial cells and macrophages, which contributes to the DIC by resulting in thrombosis throughout the body. This is one of the diseases that adults are affected a little more than young rabbits, and I'm not exactly sure why that happens. And here's a picture of a liver um, from one of these affected animals. And one of the things that you're going to notice is that it is sort of an orange color. And uh, depending upon the species, uh, first thing we want to think about with orange colors is, is something we looked at before, and that would be uh, that would be hepatic lipidosis. Certainly, I could I could uh, give you a great explanation why this liver would be fatty. It's a stressed rabbit. It's dying. Um, the hepatocytes are affected by a virus, and they are taking up lipid but they're not getting rid of it because the uh, the energy machinery producing ATP is not there, and so they cannot complex it with lipoproteins. All that is good. Um, if you see areas of, of hemorrhage in here um, or areas of pallor, I'm also going to think about the possibility of necrosis. And uh, I've seen necrotic livers look very orange or yellow or even grayish. So... Necrosis is one of the things that is going to go through my mind when I see an orange liver. So don't be taken in. Not every orange-yellow liver is going to be simple lipidosis. Here's a nice picture. Another liver. This one's a little better. We have large areas of hemorrhage. Whenever I see hemorrhage in the body, I was going to think about necrosis. So you got to sort of put these together. I said that we would start seeing a lot of lipid and and 
oftentimes you have to sort of noodle your way through some of these livers when you take a look. Um, and look at the amount of necrosis, uh, probably hem more hemorrhage and thrombosis in the lung, another very characteristic finding along with the enteritis that you will see in these rabbits. So that's a Khaleesi virus that affects the liver. Um, other Khaleesi viruses that affect the liver, well, there is one in cats. Um, used to be the Khaleesi virus would just cause ulcers in the mouth and maybe a mild interstitial pneumonia. There is a highly pathogenic Khaleesi virus that was identified a number of years ago in California. It seems to be spreading spontaneous mutations within various shelters. And one of the things that that will do is cause necrosis in internal organs. The, uh, path, the mortality goes way up in these animals, to 75%. You can see hepatic necrosis there. But Khaleesi viruses, when I think about liver disease, it's mostly going to be rabbits. Let's talk about bunya viruses. Okay, bunya viruses tend to think of about a lot of birth defects, uh, maybe some encephalitis, but in, uh, in small ruminants in Africa, you will see bunya virus, which causes a disease, a hemorrhagic fever known as Rift Valley fever, not only in uh, uh, not only in uh, small ruminants, a uh, really bad thing for sheep, but also can be transmitted to people as well. This particular uh, bunya virus causes severe hepatic necrosis. There's a related bunya virus causing, causing a disease caused, called Wesselbron's disease, which is not really as severe. So let's focus on the severe hemorrhage and necrosis, which we see in the livers of uh, young, especially young sheep. This is a disease that's transmitted by mosquitoes, and you can get it in calves as well. Mortality can be up to 30% in calves and even higher in, uh, in lambs. The, uh, the, it is a hemorrhagic fever, so the gross lesions are going to be uh, uh, those of widespread hemorrhage. Um, anywhere from cirrhosal petechia to a severe gastrointestinal bleed, and that you see very characteristically uh, coagulative necrosis and hemorrhage within the centrolobular hepatocytes. The damage to the liver often results in, in uh, a, a real decrease in the uh, amount of clotting factors are produced and the widespread hemorrhage uses them up very quickly. So it will quickly develop into a hemorrhagic diastasis and uh, mortality 30% in calves, but when you get into, uh, into lambs, it's almost 100% mortality. But that drops off significantly um, over a week of age to maybe net back down to 20 to 30%. Uh, affected uh, sheep are going to abort and this can be a real problem. It's mosquito transmitted and humans can get uh, uh, Rift Valley fever. So some humans will develop uh, a hemorrhagic fever after the bite of uh, mosquitoes, uh, Culex or Aedes, which are, are transmitting this particular disease. The lesions will be best seen, of course, in, in very young animals or aborted fetuses. You will see eosinophilic intranuclear inclusion bodies and hepatocytes and widespread vasculitis and thrombosis throughout the body. Like other Brunia viruses, um, it can cause really severe uh, neurologic defects in the developing fetus, including hydranencephaly or poor encephaly, but that's not really what this particular virus is known for. How about another uh, type of virus that affects the liver? These are the flaviviruses, and look at this liver. It's big and yellow and greasy, and this is yellow fever, which is a zoonotic disease which affects uh, non-human primates, especially uh, New World primates. And of course, I work at a place called Walter Reed, and Walter Reed was a uh, army major who was one of the identifiers of the cause of yellow fever viruses due to his work in the, uh, the Panama Canal Zone back in the uh, late 1800s, um, where all the work was done on yellow fever. 
Yellow fever virus uh, comes from a, a, a genus of flaviviruses, which also includes a lot of other significant diseases of humans, including dengue fever, West Nile, Zika, and other lesser known uh, uh, encephalitis like Japanese encephalitis. Now, this is, to me, a somewhat classic appearance, a little different than some of the other viruses because affected non-human primates um, will have this very enlarged, soft, friable, greasy yellow liver. And it's just absolutely jam-packed with fat. Remember, psychopatocytes can take up fat, but they can't get rid of it. And so you get more than any other type of, uh, of virus. You get this big fatty liver, but it's not just fat. There's a tremendous amount of mid-zonal hepatocellular necrosis. Very specific. This virus is very specific for the mid-zonal hepatocytes. And you'll see a number of inclusions under the microscope. Um, and they go by names of, of people because so much work was done on this in the human. Um, you can see them in the uh, in the cytoplasm, those are called councilman bodies. They're actually just cytosegrosomes or apoptotic bodies. Every cell wants to survive, and one of the ways it does is it sort of, sort of condenses its assets, and it will try to uh, uh, get down to a leaner, meaner, less energy-taking cell to survive, and it will reuse a lot of its parts. So you have large cytosegrosomes within these particular affected hepatocytes before they totally um, become necrotic. You can also see inclusions within the nucleus as, as well called Torres bodies. They're not really viral particles. They're just sort of aggregates of uh, lipoproteins and amino acids and various histones. But one of the keys histologically of this particular condition is the tremendous fatty degeneration of the remaining hepatocytes. And there's not a whole lot of inflammation as well. This is, uh, this is another mosquito-borne disease. It probably originated in Africa and then spread to the New World during the transatlantic trade where the, uh, the non-human primates had no uh, natural protection. And one of the classic... Uh, uh, you know, anecdotes about uh, when yellow fever comes into a new area of the jungle in South America is that the monkeys just drop out of the trees um, in people, and that's been reported a number of times in parks in, in uh, very South American cities, which have indigenous populations of New World primates. And it's probably very disconcerting to be raining monkeys down on your head. Most of the research is done in old world primates. Um, the virus, even though it comes from Africa, um, does infect old world primates, especially those from Asia. And it's very lethal in Asian macaques and the disease mimics human infection very well. So this big, greasy, ready to fracture liver, something that you would see in association with yellow fever. Well, here's a, a jaundice New World monkey. And if you want to say there's yellow fever, I couldn't fight with you. But certainly, um, there are a lot of things that will cause uh, uh, icterus in uh, non-human primates. So I wouldn't particularly pick any one virus or any one toxin just because someone shows me a yellow monkey. But if you have something like this that goes with it in a very uh, necrotic yellow liver, areas of hemorrhage. Okay, we remember we're going to talk about lipidosis, but if I start seeing hemorrhages throughout the body, there might be a little hemorrhage up here in the chest as well. This is one of the characteristics of this particular condition. Hemorrhages throughout the body along with the big yellow liver. I'm thinking that that's probably necrotic more than it's just lipid. And this was a condition that was identified in uh, New World primates, so marmosets and, and the other calotrichids which was referred to as calotrichid hepatitis. And it took probably about 10 years before it was actually figured out by Dr. Dick Montali um, and a group at the National Zoo. And then this turns out to be a virus that is extremely common in rodents. And back then, uh, people would, would give uh, these little pinky or baby mice to, uh, uh, to the New World primates as part of environmental enrichment because monkeys do like to... Uh, to eat small mammals from time to time. And then these animals would come, would come down with, uh, with icterus, with subcutaneous and intramuscular and interperitoneal hemorrhage and marked necrosis of the liver. 
And there were 13 reported outbreaks in, in the United States and Great Britain and Brazil between 1981 and 1993. And that's how long it took to figure out what was actually going on. And this is an arena virus, which is endemic in mice worldwide. It's well known in hamsters and in people that cause a disease known as lymphocytic Choriomeningitis does a very similar thing in hamsters. The virus itself doesn't really cause any problem in hamsters or people, but it's one of those that it is very difficult for hamsters and people to develop antibodies that will clear this infection. So they have large amounts of non-neutralizing antibodies and large amounts of proliferating viral antigen, which eventually get to a critical point where they begin to cause inflammation and they result in vasculitis. Um, it's a real problem um, and a good reason why people who are immunosuppressed or just had a, a organ transplant should not have hamsters because they s are so often infected, and even other types of rodents. But the bottom line is that these pinky mice that were being sold and fed, pinky mice used to be just, you know, raised willy-nilly. Now it's a very highly regulated cottage industry because we know a number of different agents that they can transmit, even besides this arena virus. But they were giving uh, the arena virus to these new world primates who were affected by it, um, and it would result in uh, massive hepatic necrosis. It's pretty profound lymphocytic and neutrophilic infiltrate. There are, uh, and this is one that causes apoptosis, um, large uh, cytoplasmic inclusions, which are actually just cytosegrosomes. And there's necrosis not only in the liver, but you'll also see it in lymph nodes and the adrenal cortex, uh, spleen, gastrointestinal tract. The only thing that is sort of like uh, the traditional lymphocytic choriomeningitis, although it's the exact same virus, is that you will often see a lymphocytic meningitis and a perivasculitis within the brain. But it's very specific to calotrichids, um, like the small marmosets and tamarind monkeys, and it is due to the infection with the same arena virus that will cause lymphocytic choriomeningitis in human primates. Okay, moving on to a totally different type of virus that will affect the liver and cause severe necrosis. And it can cause severe necrosis. You either cause necrosis or you don't, but it will cause widespread necrosis and liver failure. And this is one that we see in pigs in this great picture by Dr. Sarang Kigdan Sukanwat in uh, uh, Tulalankorn University. Um, massive necrosis, an icteric pig, and this is due to porcine circovirus. Porcine circovirus, two related disease. There are so many different syndromes that you should be aware of. Um, and one of the things that has been reported is widespread hepatic necrosis. It has, this has been identified. It has been repeated um, in animals and is a combination of a necrotizing hepatitis. And also you get the classic granulomatous inflammation with botryoid inclusions in here as well. Um, when you see it, these livers are extremely inflamed and there are only a few remaining very swollen hepatocytes. Um, it starts in the central central library of hepatocytes and it moves out um, and eventually the entire liver is going to be affected and these animals will die of, uh, of liver failure. There's a study um, investigating a uh, hundred livers for pigs with clinical uh, porcine circovirus 2 infections. And uh, in 70% of the livers, viral antigen was identified in multiple cell types in the liver, including hepatocytes, Kupfer cells, and an inflammatory uh, infiltrate that would pop up. So it does very commonly affect the liver. It may not manifest as part of the clinical syndrome, but uh, you know, nowadays, anything I see in pigs, I'm going to include porcine circovirus 2 on my list because there's so many different, interesting, and unique syndromes associated with this type of viral infection. Okay, here's a very colorful liver from a, uh, from a horse. And let's not forget the lentiviruses. Lentiviruses generally do not particularly affect the liver. They cause a lot of different diseases in the respiratory tract, in ruminants, um, 
could be in the brain or in the uh, uh, synovium in ruminants, a lentiviral disease that you will see lesions in the liver, which are not particularly those of necrosis, is equine infectious anemia, um, which is actually a matolymphatic disease caused by a, uh, a lentivirus. Um, the only change the lentivirus will actually do directly to the liver will cause a marked Kupfer, hyper, Kupfer cell hyperplasia. But what you see is you see because of the uh, infection of the bone marrow and of the erythrocytes, you're going to see all of this pigmentation is the result of uh, erythrocyte lysis, uptake of hemosiderin by Kupfer cells. This is going on in multiple organs, including the spleen, including the bone marrow, including the adrenal glands. And this is what you are going to see. You're going to see a very large uh, engorged liver with tremendously prominent sinusoids due to not only a a, the lysis of erythrocytes, you're also going to see some periporal lymphocytic infiltrates, you'll see cup for cell hyperplasia, and you often will see, especially in acute stages, you may see extramedullary hematopoiesis. So it's a very busy liver under the microscope, and even grossly, there will be some significant changes in the liver. This is a woodchuck. In some parts of the world, or some parts of this country, they're also known as marmots or groundhogs. They're large burrowing uh, uh, rodents who have a particular type of hepatinovirus, which is very similar to hepatitis B in humans. Ducks have a hepatinovirus, and this will cause initially necrosis of hepatocytes in these animals, but um, eventually will result in hepatocellular uh, tumors, especially hepatocellular uh, uh, carcinoma. And woodchucks are well known. They were used especially in the 80s and 90s um, for research into hepatocellular carcinoma and ultimately into the pathogenesis of hepatitis B. There are um, some other rodents which have similar hepatinoviruses, including the beachy ground squirrel. Woolly monkeys have a hepatitis B virus. Herons have a hepatitis B, B virus. And they all fall into the genus ortho, ortho hepatinoviruses. It starts out with hepatitis, and then it may or may not go on to hepatocellular carcinoma. Chimpanzees also will get something that is very similar. And when we get into the neoplasms of the liver of chimpanzees, we will talk about the high incidence of hepatocellular carcinoma because so many chimpanzees are infected with hepatitis B and hepatitis C. The virus, the hepatovirus does not really do much to the liver. It generally is, the damage is done through uh, uh, the cytotoxicity of CD8 positive T lymphocytes and then the viral DNA is going to be integrated into the host cell genome near the locus of CMYC or NMYC2, and that is where later on, if there is a second injury, you will have development of hepatocellular carcinoma. Okay, and we're gonna we're gonna cover these last three slides again when we get down to tumors of the liver. But we cannot talk about uh, viral disease of a liver without addressing um, various viruses which will cause lymphoma in the liver of avian species, especially chickens. And this is one where I think grossly you can get into a lot of trouble if you think that you can identify one from the other from the other. And I'm gonna throw you show you three slides in quick succession. Here is one with a diffusely enlarged uh, liver exhibiting hepatomegaly, but most of this uh, white material that's been added are neoplastic lymphocytes. Here is one that is very nodular in the distribution of nodules of lymphoma. Another one that is, once again, we see some very uh, discrete areas of lymphoma. There are three viruses that will cause lymphoma in chickens. One is gallant herpes virus type 2, which causes Merrick's disease. And this is a picture of Merrick's disease. Another one is avian retrovirus, which will cause visceral tumors, especially in the liver. They cause lymphoma. And the third one is reticuloendothelial virus, which tends to cause similar tumors in affected birds. 
Merrick's disease, T cells. Avian retrovirus or leukosis virus, generally B cells. Often you'll see lesions in the viscera and in the bursa. This is an egg transmitted disease that's more seen in, usually seen in sexually mature birds. And then reticular endotheliosis doesn't really care whether it is a, a T or a B cell. But uh, I think you can get in a lot of trouble trying to say this one is, uh, is Merix and this one is leukosis. I try to refrain from that. Um, occasionally you, you know, will be lucky enough that someone is interested in, in actually tracking it down and, and paying for PCR or other tests that will allow differentiation of the different viruses. In my experience, it doesn't happen all that much um, because so many of the flocks, especially in this part of the country, have in all of these viruses, or at least the first two are sort of endemic, and they just have a background of birds that will develop this disease, and it's sort of accepted as part of raising a poultry flock. Um, even histologically, very different tell one from the other. Dr. Cindy Bell, a number of years ago, uh, noted to me she has a lot of experience in poultry, and she said, well, in her experience, the Marix disease cases histologically on H&E, the neoplastic lymphocytes tend to be a lot more beaten up. You have a lot more apoptosis in there. They just don't look as good as the lymphoid leukosis. I don't know if I can hang my hat on it. It has sort of borne some fruit in the animals that were tested but uh, I just sort of keep that in the back of my mind, and I just try not to get cornered into saying this one's Marix, this one. There are certain uh, there are certain things that you can see primarily in Marix that you might not see in leukosis, uh, such as uh, infiltration of hair follicles or infiltration of uh, uh, large peripheral nerves like the sciatic nerves, which might tip me. But when I'm looking at tumors in the liver. No, I will not um, get backed into a corner on that one. Okay, so that brings this lecture to a close. We certainly haven't covered every different type of uh, virus that will cause liver disease, but I hope that I've given you a number of groups and maybe a number of species that I think that we should all be cognizant of. There is so much going on in this area right now. So, um, But it's been an hour, and I think that... Uh, uh, we should probably draw this one to a close. Um, the next lecture, or maybe two, are going to be on bacterial diseases of the liver, so I look forward to bringing that one to you. And uh, thanks so much for spending an hour with me on viral diseases of the liver. Have a great day.